from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, MEI's Editorial Director. On today's program, we're going to be discussing the scourge of antiquities looting in the Middle East and regional and international efforts to address the issue. I'm joined today by two excellent guests to discuss this issue. Larry Schwartz, former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Diplomacy with the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, and Dominique Giovanni, Vice President of Red Arch, a nonprofit that researches solutions to legal, political, and risk management problems impacting endangered culture. Larry, Dominic, welcome to the program, and thank you both for joining me today. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you very much. Larry, I'd like to start with you. For our listeners, can you give us a sense of how big of a problem antiquities, looting, and trafficking is? Well, actually, I can't, in part because we don't know. One of the things that's really shocking about antiquities looting is it's been going on for so very long. It's hard to know when it happens more and when it happens less. But we actually have had evidence from the recent period of instability that's been taking place in the Middle East over the past five or six years that antiquities looting increases rapidly when the forces of normal law and order begin to lose authority. So we actually have seen uh, photographs from space of the increased looting that's taken place, for example, in Egypt from the time uh, immediately after the revolution until today. It's been actually quite shocking to see in many countries how the absence of law and order results in sort of a widening of the opportunism that takes place by criminal gangs to loot uh, antiquities. And at the same time, of course, we've been experiencing in recent years the terrible situations of war in the Middle East, particularly in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, where some people who have ideological views about antiquities and believe that perhaps they are religiously impure, feel a need to destroy them or otherwise raise funds for their terrorist enterprises using antiquities, which they can sell on the open markets. The good news for that has been that it's been largely stopped, particularly in Syria and Iraq, in part by the excellent work, the financial action task forces that have been set up by our Department of Treasury and others to bring about a cessation of trade and financial movements uh, between terrorist groups and legitimate business groups. But the fact is, is there's still quite a bit of Syrian and Iraqi antiquities that have been liberated from their proper homes and which are now in the market and shouldn't be. Dominic, taking a step back, why is this issue so important, especially in the Middle East? There's a lot of concern right now in the Middle East, specifically because of the so-called terrorist activity that is connected with cultural heritage. Though some people believe that, there is a connection, but the connection monetarily may not be as much as people exaggerate it to be, in my opinion. No, but you're quite right. The, in fact, it's widely believed to be a fairly small amount of the revenues that uh, ISIS and others have been able to raise, but it's not without merit at all. Absolutely. You know, I think it's an awareness issue. And because it's in front of you, because it's ISIS, because it's terrorism, you know, it's a red flag. It goes up on the screen and people pay attention to it. But like Larry said, this has been going on for decades and hundreds of years. And people do it for different reasons for in different countries. You know, it could be economic reasons and people live in poverty and a lot of times it's a small person who just wants to make a dollar to help feed his family and they're asked to loot by some organization and give it to a middleman and it goes up the chain from there but i think the disaster of destruction and the idea that there's an element of terrorism it sort of helps the awareness issue and lets everyone know that it's happening. Like Larry said, you know, people are not aware. They don't know. And we need to put these issues in front of people in all different areas on different platforms in order to help us and assist us to get legal authority. Like Larry was saying, in the U.S., we need better laws. And other countries need to do that as well. 
also to assist the collaborations between countries, which oftentimes has been blocked by political ill will. There's an important element here that we're dealing with right now, and that's the war that continues in Yemen, the civil war that's been going on now more than four years. And the Yemeni government has actually provided evidence that their museums and storage places of antiquities have been looted or destroyed. And this is one of the oldest, you know, continuous human civilizations in the world, Yemen. And they have immeasurable numbers of antiquities that have been found, many that have not been found. But their museums have become places for rampant theft. And they believe that uh, terrorist elements have actually grabbed these antiquities following the example of ISIS in uh, Iraq as an effort to uh, raise funds. We have an opportunity right now to add antiquities from Yemen to the existing executive order which bans the imports of other things from Yemen. It's something that we should undertake now and Treasury in its next revision of its import restrictions against Yemen should add antiquities uh, to the list of banned imports. I wanted to add to that, just because something is banned doesn't mean it's not happening, does not mean it's not being imported into your country, because there are clandestine ways to do that. And obviously things are transshipped around the world. These organizations that work with cultural heritage smuggling, they are networked. And it is a strategic way for them to do it. They have their contacts. There are other people in other countries that they set up so they can move things around the world so it doesn't seem obvious to those who are looking, like law enforcement, customs officials, and the like, to be able to detect what they're doing. They're making it much more difficult for someone, I should say, to find out what they're doing. This is an extraordinary problem when you think about it. Antiquities have been stolen as long as they're been antiquities discovered by other cultures. And I think there's rarely a tourist that goes to any other country in the world now that doesn't buy something that they think has some kind of interesting history, cultural, or artistic value. So the movement of stuff around the world is quite extraordinary. And then within the context of the global movement of trade, which is so much greater every year, I think most Americans aren't even aware of how much stuff transits the world every day and which comes through our customs process. So the situation is we currently do not have a rules-based system for antiquities. It's somewhere between the individual's purchase of a small knickknack for their shelf and uh, statues of enormous historic and cultural importance. We have to figure out a way to establish a process for societies and for uh, the legitimate market for antiquities to operate. Uh, That system does not truly exist. I think that the tariff scheduling system that we have is quite inadequate. You have in Chapter 97 articles that are over 100 years old, and that could be anything. But even with that aside, the person who smuggles does not want you to know what he has. So he's going to fabricate all the information. It's going to be a different article. He'll say it's something else. he say it's from some other time, from some other country, to confuse the law enforcement so they may just pass it on. That's what the smuggler wants you to do. He doesn't want you to look. He wants you just to let it go and get by you, and he's made his profit right there. Do you have any sense of what part of this trade is the smuggling versus people who are kind of knowingly or looking the other way or not asking any questions, shall we say, kind of engaging in it versus actively they know this is criminal and we're actively trying to obscure the origin of the item and things like that? Do you have any sense of how much of it is that kind of gray versus black market enterprise? I think a lot of it's gray. The smuggling market itself has been in the shadows And it's been like that forever, as long as we have people, I'm sure they've been smuggling. But it's a type of thing that even in the structured 
markets that we have, auction markets, whatever, that they really don't want to divulge who they're getting things from, who they're selling things to. So in that sense, it's that gray area that I don't want you to know about my transaction. And I think we need to develop ways legally. Obviously, there is a Bank Secrecy Act where they're trying to have uh, dealers and collectors on that platform so that they can tell what their financial transactions are so that governments can know. I mean, our government in particular. And I feel if other people in other industries have to do that, why not people who deal with antiquities and art? Is that, as you see it, the kind of biggest legal and policy challenge for dealing with this problem? I would say it's one of them. The other legality is we're just a catch and release type of law enforcement element. And in the past, you know, that's been the problem. I would say before 15 years ago, it was just, we're going to find it. And if we do, then we'll return it. But the hardest part is prosecuting. And the reason for that is an investigation takes many years. You don't just find something and then you wrap that up in a month or so. You know, it takes years to go find out all the background information that you need to present your case. And it's hard to get a prosecutor to stay with you on that, you know, who's willing to take his time from everything else to stick with that particular antiquity or art case. It comes back to the matter of priorities, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You can take that to the big issue of international diplomacy. You know, uh, problems of illegal imports or exports of antiquities from a country rarely become priority discussions for government-to-government -government engagement at the State Department and other levels. So our Middle Eastern countries are regrettably, never much been interested in this issue. The antiquities ministries are usually matched with the tourism industry. So typically across the MENA region, it's uh, their antiquities and tourism ministries are typically very poorly funded, not well staffed, and are among the lowest priority agencies of their respective governments. And so in a region marked by kings and authoritarian governments, it's rare that a minister of antiquities is able to get the issue of what to do about protecting their own antiquities on the agenda for government discussion. And they rarely raise it with our ambassadors even, because our ambassadors overseas would certainly relay it back to the Department of State and the U.S. government if it were an issue that were boiling over in any particular country. And so rarely do we find uh, this discussion meeting action that needs to be taken. I find that here in the United States, it's even an issue. I mean, not that it's on the top of the list. That's not what I'm talking about. It's part of it. But just to get your own government to be aware about something that you're so passionate about, there's many people, there's many different areas that are involved in antiquity and art smuggling. And a lot of people do a lot of fine work. But Criminally speaking, in law enforcement, there's many more things that are more important to not only the law enforcement community, but the political yep. community in the United States. When I was working with U.S. Customs, I mean, I could jump up and down and people wouldn't notice what I was doing. And I could make seizures and we'd work with special agents. I was a customs officer. So basically, I find something, I move it up the chain to investigators. But even for us to do our work, it's difficult because it's not a priority. And like Larry was saying, in foreign countries, you know, that's the lowest level. For instance, in India, for law enforcement, that's a punishment detail to work in uh, Tamil Nadu, southern India. They would relegate them to that force because they did something that was against their superiors. And lately that's changed. You know, over the last, I guess, eight to 10 years, it's gotten better because one is the Subhash Kapoor case, and there are other cases that have brought light to the big issue, and people realize that is a crime. And that's the thing. There are crimes that are evident, but 
antiquity smuggling is not. And in our diplomatic agenda, it's really kind of sad, and here's a way of looking at it. We've had legal authority to establish bilateral cultural property agreements between the United States and other countries based on a fairly simple memorandum of understanding process, an MOU process. Doesn't have to go to treaty, doesn't have to be sent to Congress for approval, but we can actually establish agreements limiting the trade in antiquities to those that are legal exports. But in the 30 years that the State Department had the authority to do this, we only managed to create 15 agreements with other countries and none with the MENA region. So starting a few years ago, with the growth of ISIS and its efforts to smuggle antiquities in the Middle East at state, we thought, well, let's try and do something about this. And we negotiated uh, bilateral agreements with Egypt and with Libya, both of which were experiencing major losses at the time. And we also have begun negotiations with Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Jordan, Lebanon, and Yemen, all are in various stages now of progress. I'm confident that within the next uh, couple of years, we can complete bilateral agreements uh, with these countries and essentially say to uh, our own customs people that when these agreements go into effect, antiquities coming into the United States must show that they have been legally purchased. We're putting the obligation on the importer to prove that the antiquities that are coming into the country are legal. And when given that sort of legal authority, I believe our customs people can do what's necessary. Just to back that up, I firsthand can tell you that that is very important. And I myself and people I've worked with, obviously the MOU, it's not the normal channel politically, legally, of doing things as far as regulation is concerned. So it gives you a green light to do something. And people in Washington are telling the customs officer on the front line that I want you to look for this specific type of item or from a certain country. And if the officer is not aware of it, not educated, not knowledgeable, he's not going to know that that's something that's a priority, something that needs to be watched for. So, like I said, I've had cases where I was made aware of a bilateral, and I went out and searched for that country's goods, and it had been effective. Where I had found something, or my team, we found something, and it turned out to be seized and repatriated. So it does make a difference in terms of kind of selling it up the chain of command and saying, this is an important priority for us. This is something we should be looking for. Right. And you need to get it to the people on the front line of that chain of command who are responsible for stopping things like the customs officer. I think looking forward, we need to be really clear about where the greatest challenges are and to move forward, lean in on this issue, particularly in countries that are under great danger. And Yemen would certainly be one of them. And I would really strongly urge that uh, the Treasury Department take immediate action to sanction illegal imports from Yemen, for example. But it's a shock to me that so many years after 2001, we still haven't got a bilateral agreement with Afghanistan. Here is the country that brought this image of the destruction of antiquity to all of our minds in a very vivid way with the Taliban destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas. There is a process of repairing them underway, but that still means we haven't actually taken action, diplomatic action, in the country where this all came most vividly to our attention. Secondly, none with Pakistan, where the Indus Valley civilization has been under slow theft for many, many years. It has a lot to do with our collaboration as humans around the world. And it's about where we came from, civilizations, how they're tied together. And it's very important to preserve that, to preserve the idea that we are all here together and we need to work together to solve our problems. 
Absolutely. It's our shared history and our shared humanity that's at stake ultimately here. We're going to have to leave it there. I'm afraid we're out of time. But Dominic, Larry, thank you both for joining us today. Sure. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to our production team for their work on today's program. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.